good morning, everybody. We, we've had several comments on that little video clip, uh, and one of them, somebody asked Debbie Donay, our, our kids' pastor, who was the woman with Pastor Ike up there? <laughs> so, <laughs> something else to work through with my therapist. Um, <laughs> Oh my goodness. Hey, happy Mom's Day to everybody. And my mom went to be with Jesus three and a half years ago. And I just pray they have a super, super duper brunch up there. And I could just see my mom at the dessert area just hanging out there. So, um, oh gosh, we've been looking at these top 10 things the last couple of weeks. And we based this short sermon series on Hosanna Wong's book, How Not to Save the World. It's a great little book. Uh, you can borrow mine. Mine's got all kinds of notes in it. Well, maybe, you sh- maybe you should borrow Pastor Ike's because mine's all marked up. But, um, but um, Hosanna Wong's this young lady. When I grew up, I wanted to be as smart and holy as she is. Um, but she shares uh, these amazing stories based on just how she, she messed it up sharing her faith. Um, and I don't know how, about you guys, but I've learned way more from my failures than I have from any of my successes. Maybe some of you guys can relate to that. Um, We've called this series the top 10 things you should never say or do to save the world. And not, I'm not sure if these are the top 10, but these are things, us church folks, that we mess up all the time when we're trying to share our faith or to, to share, you know, just the love of Jesus to, to folks that we know, maybe don't know who Jesus is or what God's all about. Pastor Ike introduced us to this series a couple weeks ago, to the first three, How Not to Save the World. How not to save the world, always fly solo, compare yourself to others, fight the wrong battles. Then last week, three more, how not to save the world, live to please people, only do what's been done, and then despise the church or despise the bride. And today we'll race through four more of these, but I want to start first with some audience participation, okay? Uh, What would you do in this situation? Um, A week ago, Tuesday night, we had just finished a meeting here at church, a town hall meeting. It's close to 9 o'clock. I'm tired, and I just want to go home. And I'm at a red light. My wife is hearing this for the first time, but she knows the story. I'm at a red light on Broadway at Highlands Ranch Parkway. I'm heading south on Highlands Ranch, on on Broadway, Highlands Ranch Parkway. I'm trying to make a left-hand turn. Um, And the light goes through three cycles without giving me uh, an arrow to turn left. Now, now I've been making left-hand turns at that light for 19 years now, every cycle, every time for 19 years, or at least up till that night, every time it goes green to the folks east and west, or it turns red for the east and west folks on Highlands Ranch Parkway, the left-hand folks, the folks who are heading south on Broadway to turn left on the Highlands Ranch Parkway, they get a green arrow. So I wait three cycles. Nothing. The north-south folks get green, but no green to us left-hand turn folks. Three cycles. And I'm first in line on this turn lane. Um, That's important because there's a line of folks, cars behind me now. What would you do? What would you do? And And I'm thinking, this is what I did. I'm thinking to myself, in my little mind, I've got to help these folks behind me. I mean, this is all self sacrifice to these people. These folks are waiting behind me. They're probably tired just like me. Some of them probably haven't seen their families, maybe in days. Some, some of them maybe haven't eaten all day. They're hungry, maybe a little cranky. Maybe I'm projecting here. But, but I need to save them from this near crisis of a situation with no turn arrow for our left-hand people. So I very respectfully, very respectfully, very cautiously run the red light. And mind you, there's no no traffic, not a car in sight coming the other way. But that's when I meet this young deputy from the Douglas County (laughs) Sheriff's Department. (laughs) He was back behind me somewhere in the turn lane. I couldn't see him. Even if I could have seen him, I I think I still would have gone. Um, Son of a biscuit. (laughs) I, 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 I haven't even finished making my illegal turn and the blue lights come on. <laughs> he pulls me over and he comes to the passenger window, side window, he tells me what I know already, and I'm ready to fight this guy as he asks for my driver's license. Officer, three cycles. It went through three cycles. And he calmly says, I just saw one cycle. Uh, um, no, it was three cycles. And I begin to argue with him and these words come out of my mouth. Officer, I'm not arguing with you as I'm arguing with him. 
And he, and he didn't even let me tell him that I was not doing it just for me, but it was for the folks behind me. I was doing it to help them. Shoot, they could have been there till, till like the next day. Yes, Mr. Hess, I've heard it before. And, and, and uh, as he walks away with my license, I said, it's Mr. Pastor to you. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, how, okay, I'll come back to the story, I promise you, at the end. Um, how not to save the world. Point number one today, how not to save the world, rely on your own power. We all know we live in a hurting, hurtful world. We all know that. We've experienced it. We see it on the news, or we're living it out right now in our homes or in our jobs or in our schools. What's our part? Do we have a part in helping a hurting, hurtful world? And most of us would say, yes. We want to help, but we don't even know where to start. But I want to share these simple truths. And, I, and if I could have you guys repeat them after me. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus has the power to save. Jesus has the power to save. We do not. One more time. Jesus, Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus has the power to save. Jesus has the power to save. We do not. We do not. Jesus is this, no more repeats. Jesus is the Savior, not us. One of my favorite lines from one of my favorite movies, Rudy, it's a great theological football movie. Rudy is trying to get into Notre Dame, and he's tried everything. He goes to the Catholic priest from Notre Dame that's been helping him, and Rudy asks him, what more could he do to get into Notre Dame? And the priest answers, there's two things I believe to be true. Number one, there is a God, and number two, I'm not God. Jesus is the Savior, not us. And when we speak of Jesus as the Savior, he's already done the hard stuff. Through Jesus and God's amazing, unconditional love, for each of us knuckleheads, sin is forgiven and death is conquered. From the cross, when Jesus said, it is finished, ufta in Norwegian, I learned that this past week. Um, when Jesus said, it is finished, it was all, our sins, all our stuff, past, present, and future, all forgiven, Wiped away by the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then three days later on that first Easter morning, when the ladies came looking for Jesus and the tomb was empty, death was conquered too. Forgiven and healed, Jesus has given us new life. From St. Paul, the wages of sin, the cost of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And I love this line, and I borrow it from Hosanna's book. Jesus' mission here on earth was not to make bad people good, but to bring dead people back to life. And we're all, some, some real way, we're all dead until we meet Jesus, until we accept him into our life. And Jesus wrote these words, John's Gospel 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus speaking to us, I have come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. And I borrow these thoughts from Hosanna Wong's book, our call to be like Jesus is not a call to save, it's a call to show up and serve. Our mission, our mission to love the world, Jesus came to save. And just some examples of when we do church close to being right, Pastor Ike brought it up just that the, the community diaper drive yesterday. Almost 30,000 diapers collected by this community and beyond. It was amazing and powerful. Um, and, and not just that, but the 25-plus the volunteers, including kids that came to help us unload and bring those diapers down into our storage area in, in the bottom of our church. It was amazing. All for low-income families here in the South Metro area, struggling to make ends meet. We're, we're told, I, 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 don't, I don't remember the numbers because our kids are older, but the cost to diaper a baby for a month, it's about 100 bucks a month. And some of you guys know. Um, if families can save that money and use it towards rent or food, I think we're showing up and serving the world that Jesus came to save. First service this morning, we probably have a similar number um, in this second service. We have 20 plus, 25 folks that help put this church service on every, every Sunday, from musicians to volunteers to Sunday school teachers to deacons and elders, all servers, showing up to just try to be the hands and feet of Jesus. We can do some really cool things here as a church, but I also know we can blow it. I blow it. And not just our church, but church, capital C, all the churches. A week ago, I was asked to call a woman, not someone from our church. She had lost her husband of 50 years, and she was struggling. 
She was grieving. And she was not only struggling and grieving the loss of her husband, but she had lost her church home too. And I don't need to share the details, and I only heard one side, but it was a real mess. And she had left her church home, and now she needed one badly. But was struggling to trust the church again. Her church had hurt her so. I know we blow it. I blow it. We, we blow it as a church. We blow it in our personal relationships. But when we've blown it, when we mess up, here's, here's a way to get through it. I want you guys to repeat these things after me as well. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Will you forgive me? And, and you can't do, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? You've got to do it from the heart. One, one more time. I'm sorry. I, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Two more quotes from Hosanna's book. The church is better. The church is better. This church, capital, little C, South Suburban Church, but the church, capital C, is better when you and I are in it. And God's community, unified together, is God's favorite plan to heal a hurting world. Number two, you and I cannot save the world, but make, make no mistake, Jesus' mission for the saving of souls will absolutely require our participation. Point number one today, how not to save the world, rely on your own power. And it's really the flip of that, rely on God's power, not your own, to save the world. And I love this, this quote from St. Paul to the folks, um, to the Ephesians, not to him. Not to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. I mean, those of us who, who have put our faith in Jesus, we have the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells in us. Point number two, how not to save the world, wait for perfect. And I've shared this with some of you guys before. 20, another, base, another sports story, um, 2016 World Series. Chicago Cubs versus Cleveland Indians, seventh game of the World Series. Joe Madden, the manager of the Cubs, wrote this on the top of his scorecard before the start of the game. Be present, not perfect. Be present, not perfect. Why, why do you think he would write that? And I don't know, I'm just guessing. Why do you think he would write that? As a manager, Joe Madden had been there before. He'd been in the World Series. He, he was manager of the Tampa Bay Rays back in 2008 when they went to the World Series, lost in five games to the Phillies. But I'm just guessing, maybe Joe Madden had white-knuckled it back then, held it, held it too tightly, was trying to be too perfect as a manager, and he managed more out of fear than courage. Those of us who are parents ever struggle with that? Be present, not perfect. One of my favorite Old Testament scriptures is Joshua 1.9. God speaking to Joshua as he's taken over from Moses. Moses, this great leader of the Israelites, has just died. Pastor Ike shared some of those stories last week. God is calling Joshua to take over from Moses and lead the Israelites finally into the promised land. And I'm thinking Joshua is a little puckered. He's uptight, doesn't want to mess it up, wants it to go well, wants it to be perfect. Again, God speaking to Joshua. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I love this term, SRD, shoddy rough draft. Every Thursday when I send a, a, a manuscript to James, our communication guy, I tell him, this is my SRD. This is my shoddy rough draft. I'm praying it'll get a, little, a lot better between Thursday morning and Sunday morning. Um, oftentimes it doesn't get any better, but, but I, I tell James up front, it's my SRD, my shoddy rough draft. And I borrow this term from one of my favorite authors and speakers, Brene Brown. She uses this term when she writes her first draft of anything. Just start take the first step, she says. Sometimes, we all know that's the hardest thing, is just starting. At times, we're wanting to do something perfectly or waiting for perfect conditions, and we don't start. We procrastinate, we delay, we're waiting for the right inspiration, the right time, the right whatever. Hosanna, in her book, shares it this way regarding some of her friends as they were leaving college. We all had taken a number, and we're sitting in the waiting room waiting for perfect, perfect job, perfect boyfriend or girlfriend, perfect opportunity, perfect offer, perfect church with the perfect pastors, i.e., right up there, perfect small group, perfect service times. A couple of quotes from Hosanna's book. Oftentimes, our fear of not being perfect stops us from trying new things 
and even taking first steps. Can anybody relate to that besides me? Afraid of failure, afraid of making a mistake, all pride issues. We often will shut doors and leave tables and walk away from opportunities. My thinking on this, God presents opportunities for us to love and serve folks. He nudges us to take a step and we make excuses not to step in or step out. Let me share this story with you. I shared it with our Face Talks group this morning. Jesus walking on water from Matthew's Gospel. Let let me set it up a little bit. Jesus Jesus has just fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. I mean, they've just experienced this miracle of miracles. Uh, They had leftovers. People are full here in their stomachs and in, in their hearts. Jesus tells the disciples, go over to the other side of the lake, and I'll meet you over there. Let me dismiss the folks. Jesus dismisses the folks, hangs out there for a while until early or late the next night, really the the fourth watch, the three to six in the morning, Jesus says. Let me pick up the story there. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on water to Jesus. But when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? In my mind's eye, I see Jesus now holding up his friend Peter as they walk arm in arm back to the boat. And who do they meet there? All the disciples who stayed safely inside the boat, the critics. And I borrow these thoughts from Hosanna. If the disciples were anything like we are when we see someone take a risk and seemingly fail, they may have made fun of him. They may have said, Peter, we can't believe you went out there. What were you thinking? Or we were watching from here, laughing our heads off, saying, we knew it. There he goes, sinking. We, really have, we have no record of what the other disciples said to Peter, but we know what we say to people who are trying something new and scary. More than that, we know what we envision other people saying to us when we're the ones heading out on a daring adventure. For many of us, that's reason enough to stay in the boat. For some of us, our fear of the critics, our fear of failing or not being perfect stops us from stepping towards Jesus. Be present, not perfect. Show up and serve Take the first step, take that scary step out of the boat when Jesus says, come. That's what faith is all about. We all start with our SRDs, our shoddy rough drafts. That's how we're going to get better. Again, this whole thing is not about us, it's about God. And I believe God calls us to use our gifts and talents and resources to love and serve the folks that are in our lives, our neighbors, our co-workers, our families. And remember the promises. God will be with us. And the power of God will be working in and through us wherever we go. Point number two, how not to save the world. Wait for perfect. We flip that around again. Don't wait for the perfect step. Just take the next step. Point number three today, how not to save the world. Hide your faith at home. How can God use us? I believe in my heart every time we step out of our homes, every time we step out of our church, every step, time we step into our regular lives, be it going to the grocery store or school or our home office or even at a red light, we have an opportunity to share the gospel, to be the gospel um, someone needs or not. Jesus' last read words in my Bible before he's taken up to heaven, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth, you will be my witnesses, or not. How do we share our faith? How do we share our faith story without being weird, or pushy, or super awkward? Hosanna references this story in her book, How St. Augustine Interprets the Good Samaritan Story. You remember the Good Samaritan Story? A guy gets beat up, a couple of Priest and Levite walk by, they walk on the other side, don't help them at all. Then the Samaritan, the out-of-towner, comes in and helps this guy. The good Samaritan helps the beat-up guy, that's not us. It's not us, St. Augustine says, that's Jesus. And the good Samaritan takes the beat-up guy, puts him on his donkey, and brings him to the innkeeper, and then asks the innkeeper to take care of the beat-up guy. 
and leaves him money in his credit card and tells the innkeeper, if it's more than this, I'll settle with you when I come back. St. Augustine says, again, we're not the Good Samaritan. That's Jesus. We're the innkeeper in the story. Jesus saves, the Good Samaritan saves. We're just called to help heal and love the people the Good Samaritan brings our way. Be it with a King Super's gift card or a box of diapers or being present with someone who's hurting or scared. And when someone who doesn't know Jesus, doesn't know anything about God, asks us why we're helping, we might share with them as honestly as we can. When I was hurting and scared, I needed to lean on something that was way bigger than me. That was God. That was Jesus. And I believe this is true with all my heart. The Good Samaritan will bring us hurting people, be it a friend or a coworker or someone you meet in the line at Trader, Trader's, Trader Joe's. The simplest way to me to share my faith with someone is to ask them if you can pray, pray with them, to model your trust in God, to model your faith, and then do it right there. Don't wait till later on because you'll forget Pray for them right there, be it on the phone or in your front yard or the parking lot outside your office. I love these lines from Hosanna's book. Jesus stepped into our world. He calls us to do the same with others. Jesus' people, us, we should be a breath of fresh air in a toxic, suffocating world. I've shared this with you guys before. We're called to smell like Jesus. And most times on my own, I smell like a goat. And it doesn't stand for greatest of all time. I, smell, I really smell like a goat, especially after I work out. I'm convinced this is what Jesus smells like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Point number three today, how not to save the world. Hide your faith at home. In your day-to-day life, be who you are and love and care for the people the Good Samaritan brings your way. Point number four, last point, how not to save the world, never take a breath. And I steal this from Richard Bach, author of Jonathan Livingston Seagull, a book he wrote maybe 40 years ago, 40 years ago, and another book he wrote way back when called Illusions, A Reluctant Messiah. And I, I love this line from that book, we teach best what was hardest for us to learn. We teach best what was hardest for us to learn. Ted Williams, one of the greatest baseball hitters ever, the the last guy to hit 400, they say he wasn't a very good teacher. Couldn't teach folks to hit. It came so natural to him. He struggled relating to guys who couldn't hit a fastball. I struggle with this one as well. Taking a break, taking a rest, taking a day off or two. Someday, if this is really true, we teach best what was hardest for us to learn. I'm going to be a great teacher of this stuff. (laughs) Right now, I'm still on the vertical learning curve and definitely a work in process. A few quotes from Hosanna's book, Hosanna's Struggle. Hosanna struggles with this too. This is Hosanna speaking. I knew how to hustle. I knew how to sacrifice. I knew how to be brave. I did not know how to be a child of God. I did not know how to enjoy God. Me too, sometimes. Number two, we are called to worship God with our work, but we are not called to worship our work. And Number three, when we refuse to rest in God, we are saying that we can accomplish his mission without him. God, through his word, through his commandment, says we're to take a break, to take a Sabbath. Shalom, Shabbat, Shabbat, Shalom. Jesus took breaks. He would often get away from the crowds and just be by himself to pray with his heavenly Father or just to be with his disciples. God's word says this to us, challenges us with this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all our understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Someday, um, someday after I've retired for a little while, when Pastor Ike needs to take a vacation, and I'm asked to come back and preach for a weekend, I'll share these thoughts with you guys. And these are some things, last summer when Cindy and I took some time off, these were things that I said, when I come back, I've got I've to master these things. And I haven't mastered them yet. But maybe you guys can relate. Number one, I need to do a quiet time, a God time every day. Prayer time, God time every day, no excuses. I'm a spiritual athlete, or I want to be. We need to exercise that muscle every day. 
quiet time, prayer time, God time every day, number one. Number two, take a Sabbath. Take one day a week where you rest or just do things that build you up. And I know this is tough. I just lost microphone there. Check, check. There we go. Thank, thank you, Gene. Take a Sabbath. Take one day a week where you rest or just do things that build you up. And I know this is tough for some of us, especially if you work here at church or you're a young, you've got young, young kids at home. But if you can, if you can, take a day, dedicate a day just for yourself. Make it a family thing. This is a day when chores and lists of have-tos are put aside and you spend time together with each other and with God. And number three, um, and I really stink at this, create space in your calendar. I want to share with you a picture, a picture of my calendar for the month of April. And that doesn't have everything. <laughs> Not a lot of space in my calendar. Tuesday this past week, uh, I have an 8 a.m. radio interview to talk about the diaper drive with, with Love, Inc., 9 a.m. worship planning meeting, 10 a.m. pastoral care meeting, 11 a.m. staff meeting, and a 2 p.m. funeral all while I'm coming down with the stomach flu. Um, and and let, me, let me share this. The stomach flu, that will help create some space in one's calendar. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Reich, for giving me some space that day. Um, number four, I'm enough. Um, I don't need to be anyone else but me. I don't know if any of you guys struggle with that. I, I see someone who, who I'm envious of or uh, compare myself to, and I want to be like that. But what God has told me over and over again, I'm enough. God's gifted me in unique ways. God's gifted each of us in unique ways. God will use what we bring. I'm enough. And lastly, and maybe this is harder than all of them, be patient. God is saying that to me. Be patient. Be patient with myself as I continue to learn these things. Be patient with the folks around me as they try and figure it all out too. Point number four, our last point, how not to save the world. Never take a breath. Again, it's the flip of that. Rest, rest in the one who saved the world. Just try to try to wrap this up and bring some closure. Going back to my, going back to my first story. Did I tell you three cycles I waited for that light to change? <laughs> three cycles, maybe an extra five, ten minutes of my life. I just didn't think it was going to change. And, and I took matters into my own hands. Again, not for my sake, but for the sake of those people behind me. It's not, it's not really true. At this point, I was tired and hungry and a little cranky. I could have cared less about those poor folks behind me. They could still be there waiting for that left-hand turn. I just wanted to get home. And that's when I got this little card, this little love note from the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Um, Sheriff Tony Spurlock encourages safe driving in Douglas County. You are given a warning today, 42622, by deputy, and I know he scribbled his name out here just so I couldn't read it, so I couldn't complain. Um, but seriously, you know what this card is? It's grace. It's grace. That what, that's what we lean on when we struggle to do this stuff. That's the gift that God gives each of us when we lean on him, and that's what we do for each other. That's what we do for each other when we remind each other how much God loves us, how much God forgives us, how much God wants to be with us, close to us, how much God wants us to follow him. I came, I came in. Hold, hold that thought. I, I, I came in this morning asking James for some grace it would be okay if I played guitar um, and ask Joy Peterski, who does our slides and stuff, hey, can we, can we put up, can we put up um, the words to Amazing Grace? And I, I shared with the first service, my, my really bad joke is that I, I know three songs on the guitar. Um, Amazing Grace, Silent Night, and Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> and, and, and I was at a funeral, I, I did a funeral for somebody, a friend of ours, about a month ago, and I shared that really bad joke. And one of the there was a bunch of kids there. One of the kids in the front, do puff, do puff. <laughs> but I'm going to do amazing grace, because if we if, if we boil it all down, what really saves is God's love for us, God's amazing grace.
that joke too is I only know the chords for the first verse. Thank you for laughing, Mom. <laughs> Amazing. 